our subject, and it can be no other, for the larger part of this chapter is the subject of sovereign mercy. That's our consideration. Now, Paul has been distinguishing between the physical Israel and the spiritual Israel. And there is a great difference between the two. He has distinguished between those who are literally descended from their father Abraham and those who are spiritually descended. Those as only physical descendants but have no spiritual life and those who have spiritual life. The chapter began with Paul's longing for the salvation of all who are of Israel. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. We considered that threefold assurance that he means exactly what he says. Verse 2, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. It could not be expressed more strongly. It's continual, it's always there, his great burden for his countrymen. Verse 3, for I could wish, but of course it is impossible, I could wish even that myself were accursed, separated from Christ, for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Although it is surprising, because The leading Jews had made themselves Paul's bitter and vicious enemies and they hounded him and they sought his assassination and on various occasions they so badly treated him and yet he's able to say these words all his concern and compassion is for their salvation and then he described the advantages that they had had And yet, coming down to verse 6, despite their rejection of God and of Christ, he says, not as though the word of God hath taken none effect. Of course, many Jewish people were saved, but many more were not. But it's not as though the word of God has been fruitless in making promises to them. And so many promises and prophecies and so many cries of salvation because not all are spiritual Israel there's a difference between the physical and the spiritual second part of verse 6 for they are not all Israel which are of Israel and then the argument continues with examples of children of Abraham who are not to be regarded as godly and those who were the children of the promise So there are examples of this principle that not all who are physically of Israel, descended in the long term from Abraham, are spiritually like him. And then we come down to uh, the examples of Esau and Jacob. And I come down to verse 13. Esau, of course, was rejected by God. Verse 13 is... uh, a quotation from Malachi, which is in the context of the judgment of Esau and so many of his posterity. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated, which means that he came under judgment for his life and his rejection of divine things. Of course, Esau was contemptuous of God. He was hostile. He was rebellious and disobedient. We see the example in the taking of his Canaanite wives. He rejected the message of his father Isaac and the things for which he stood. He's described in the letter to the Hebrews as being a profane man, a man who had no holy reserve, no holy of holies, no principle of guidance. He was violent and sensual. And he came under the judgment of God. But Jacob, when we read the history of Jacob from the beginning, he had his most uh, offensive manner and ways also. And he was a deceitful man. 
And yet God had determined to save him and set his love upon him and to shape him. And so in the history of Jacob in the Old Testament, which is recorded at great lengths, you see God working in the life of Jacob. He drew him to himself, probably at Bethel, the place that he so named, where he saw that communication, the uh, bridging between God and man, and he changed him over time and made him increasingly faithful. He set his love upon him. And so we can read in verse 14 here, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Is God unrighteous to pass by Esau and judge him justly according to that which he deserved? He had utterly rejected God. And yet not to pass by Jacob, but to determine to save him and to work in his life. Does it make God unrighteous to punish one and not the other? And the swiftest answer to that is most certainly not. It does not make God unrighteous because God punished both. He punished Esau and he punished Jacob. But God in his astonishing mercy punished Jacob in Christ and he was punished instead of Jacob. Well, you know well the doctrine of the atonement. God cannot be accused of being unjust because he punishes all, either in us or in Christ, our atoning saviour, our redeemer. And so the charge of God being unjust cannot be made. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Sometimes we alter the charge. We say, no, I, I don't suppose there is unrighteousness with God, but is there some other form of unfairness? And the Apostle Paul will answer that in due course. But I'm going to move quite swiftly through these verses until we get to verse 22, because verses 22 to 24 are among the most profound in the New Testament. But working from verse 14 in a simple expository manner, is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. God loves to save. The scripture tells us that God has no pleasure in giving punishment, but being absolutely just, he will and does punish is there unrighteousness? God forbid. God is very gracious, even to the unrighteous. Supposing there's somebody here, and you will never come to Christ, and you will never believe in him, and you will never yield your life to him, and one day you must be punished. You must suffer the wrath of God, the righteous, pure, holy, and vehement wrath of God upon your sin, his indignation at you. Yes, but in life, consider what he did for you. He gave you life. You had the privilege of life and consciousness and enjoyment, existence, a purpose, a direction, a will. You were given so much. You're not an animal. You have so much more powers and gifts and abilities. You have your very own abilities. You may have a startlingly good memory. You may be extremely discerning or even shrewd at business. You may have some powers and capacities that the generality of people do not have. God has already given you so many privileges. And he's given you the power to love. And he's given you in all probability people to love you in your family circle. And the capacity to enjoy that love. And he's given you the capacity to appreciate beauty in sound and sight 
and wonderful things and maybe even to create some of these things. What God has done for you, who will reject him and must one day be punished. Don't think that God, when it says that God hated Esau, and that is quoted from an Old Testament passage which is speaking in the context of judgment, don't think that God all your life has snarled at you. Although you're a rejecter of him, he's been amazingly kind to you and has given you all things richly to enjoy. And he's had such patience toward you. You may live until you're 70 or 80 or 90 or 100 as a rebel against God and do things hour by hour, minute by minute, which God detests. He hasn't snatched away your life. His patience towards you and his, the word here in our chapter is long-suffering, is astonishing. The kindness of God, yet it's all wasted. It's no use because it doesn't touch our hearts. It doesn't move us. It doesn't affect us. We take all these things for granted. We behave as though we made and designed ourselves. We created our powers and our pleasures and our enjoyments. He may even have answered some of your prayers. Because the scripture shows us that even the unbeliever's prayer may sometimes be answered. And is. And you may have had prayers that were faithless prayers, even selfish prayers, that God has mercifully answered and given you deliverance and help. You promptly forgot it. Maybe you're one of those who's even made him vows and promises, but you forgot them all. And you forgot that God heard you and he answered. And he did that perhaps to encourage you, to prove his presence to you. But even that's no good. He may have given you a believing parent, father, mother, both, brothers, sisters, aunts, who knows? And you've seen their lives and it hasn't touched you. And you've acknowledged they have a hold on God and a walk with him, but nothing, the privileges that you've been given and the helps and the evidence and all is in vain. So God hasn't snarled at you. Even though he knows you're a rejecter and you will be lifelong, he's been so kind to you and so mild towards you and so patient towards you. So when we read these verses, remember that. We read verse 13, Esau have I hated. And yet the kindnesses shown to Esau were incredible. It's all our fault that we reject him because God is kind even to those against whom he must turn his face. Down to 15. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Is it unfair that God should overrule in the lives of a vast multitude of people who will be brought to God and forgiven and go to heaven. All are under condemnation. All are rebels against God. All are offensive to him. God nevertheless will overrule in many lives. Is that unfair? And the answer which you'd like to hear, I'm sure, is in verse 15. It may not satisfy you, but it's the only answer we're permitted. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. I am God, he says. My will and my mind is faultless and perfect. I am God over all. You cannot question what I do. What is fair, strictly speaking, in human terms, is that no one should be forgiven. 
No one should be saved. No one deserves a drop of mercy. What is beyond fairness, far, far beyond fairness, is that God will overrule in sheer mercy and kindness and grace in countless, countless lives and draw us to himself. We can't question beyond that. It's the amazing mercy of God. Verse 16, So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Of course, in a sense, salvation is of him that willeth. Because the way God works in our lives is to make us willing and to make us feel our need of him and to make us desire salvation in Christ. But if he didn't bring that about, we would never seek him. So the verse is absolutely true. So then it is not of him that willeth of himself, nor of him that runneth, works, and deserves the favour of God, but of God, from God, that showeth mercy, and he inclines the heart and the will and turns us to himself. Now, verse 17, and the argument shifts. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Now in the course of the plagues, before the children of Israel were released from Egypt, from their bondage, and set free, in the course of the plagues, Moses is to give this message to Pharaoh. Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power. Now, what is the meaning of this? Well, of course, during the course of the plagues against Egypt, Pharaoh could have been destroyed at any time. The plague showed that. God's power was such, Pharaoh could have been swept away, but he wasn't. Plague after plague, he is preserved. Why? Well, the answer is given, and Pharaoh was told, because this is a demonstration. You are to be preserved, God says to Pharaoh. You are to be preserved so that your hardness and your ruthlessness and your power and determination to prevent the children of Israel from being set free may be seen. So that when I act as God and deliver them, it will be seen to be amazing. A deliverance that only God could possibly bring about. And all the nations around and posterity and all who read the biblical record will say to themselves, only God could have delivered the children of Israel. Pharaoh was so obdurate and determined and his army and his nation was the most powerful, invincible on the earth. They could never have been delivered. It was to show, to highlight, to demonstrate the power of God. But it was also to demonstrate the ruthlessness and the hardness of the human heart. Now we're told that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Yes, but it was already hard, hard as nails. We read that in the book of Exodus. We read the record. Time after time, Pharaoh hardened his own heart. So what did God do in hardening his heart? Well, he did this. By the fifth or the sixth plague, when Pharaoh saw the havoc that was being caused to his people and the suffering and so on, perhaps he might have buckled. He might have thought, I want to go on. I want to withstand to the end. I want to withstand God and Moses and the escape of the children of Israel. But I can't. 
I haven't got the strength to do it. I can't. My people will turn against me. They're suffering. So maybe he would have made a decision which was a political decision, not the expression of his own wicked, obdurate heart. So God fixed him, hardened him in the position which was really true of his own obdurate heart. So that when the thought came to him, I must relent, I am moved by the suffering of the people, he couldn't think like that. His own inner innate hatred of God and the people of God would continue to speak right to the bitter end so that the demonstration to all of history was the determination and the obduracy of Pharaoh. Now that's the point that the Apostle Paul draws. It was also to demonstrate the impossibility of Israel being released but for God. But this is the argument here. Verse 18, therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. So the hardening of Pharaoh was the fixing of Pharaoh, so that he didn't relent on sentimental or political grounds, but his real determination and hatred of the people of God would be expressed to the very end. And verse 18 draws the point, therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy and whom he will he hardeneth. Is that fair? Well, of course it's fair. If God chooses to judge Pharaoh for what he wants to do and his unbelief and his hatred of God and God's people, then he is fully entitled to do that. And he is fully entitled to keep Pharaoh alive and preserved from the plagues right to the end so that it can be demonstrated that when God acts, he is just. Nobody will say, was Pharaoh really that bad? Supposing Pharaoh had died early in the process, did Pharaoh really deserve to be judged by God? If he had lasted longer, would he have turned to God? Would he have changed? Would he have been uh, informed and affected by the plagues and the words of Moses? So God keeps him alive to the end, so that it's apparent that God is just and God is powerful. Verse 19, Thou wilt then say unto me, Why doth he, God, yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Well, that's a very insolent and impertinent thing to say because it's perfectly obvious that Pharaoh resisted God from the very beginning. It's not as though God is to be held responsible for making Pharaoh hard of heart from the outset. God's part in this is that he passed Pharaoh by in the overriding of sin and the giving of mercy. He blesses some and he passes others by. But it's quite wrong to say then God was in, that makes God responsible for all Pharaoh's sin. Verse 20, Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay? It's an illustration. God, his will is perfect. And we cannot question why it is that he allows some to go all the way to judgment and he intervenes mercifully in the lives of others and turns them to himself. Now I want to come down to verse 22 because uh, although time is passing quickly, verses 22 to 24, as I said, are among the most profound in the New Testament. It's one sentence. Even so, it's not the longest of sentences from the Apostle Paul. 
there's even longer ones. In this long sentence, verses 22 to 24, there are three works of God mentioned. They all concern his sovereign right and activity. I can't think of a good illustration for this, but, and I'm certainly no kind of businessman, but supposing you said to a large business or to the CEO of a large business, what's your purpose? You take a firm like Tesco. Supposing a few years ago you'd have said to the CEO, what's your purpose? What's your objective? Now, I suppose he could have replied along these lines. Our purpose is to set up a superstore in fields just outside every town, every city, and draw the people out and provide lots of parking and all the rest of it. And maybe, if this was his policy, I don't know, when we've accomplished that, then we'll mop up in the city centre. I don't mean this to sound hostile to Tesco. Then we'll mop up the city centres by having uh, smaller branches there. And so, well, he may describe his policy, his objectives. And then you say to him, yes, but forget all that. What's your most fundamental basic policy? And his answer, I suppose, would be, well, to make money for our shareholders. Well, why didn't you say that in the first place? That's much easier. I wasn't interested in the outworking of it, but your most fundamental basic aim and policy. Now, what you have here in these verses is God's fundamental basic aim and policy, not the precise details about how he intends to go about it. And it's expressed under, in three sections from verse 22. So I'm sorry for the illustration, but the first one in verse 22 is God's purpose is to vindicate and to show his justice. Our translators have put a word on the front of this long sentence in verse 22. The sentence begins, as you can see, if God willing to show his wrath, and if you read the sentence without the what on the front, very difficult to make any sense of it. So most translations follow in this. The King James translators added a word to help you make sense of the sentence. What if God? What if God? But it doesn't mean supposing God because it describes three things that God is doing quite definitely and certainly. So perhaps it would be better to express it slightly differently. Observe God's sovereign purpose. Verse 22. If God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, desiring to exhibit his righteous indignation and to make known his power, endured with much long-suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. That's the first part of God's threefold policy or purpose. That's what's happening in the world. That explains everything. Have you ever asked yourself, why is it that that wicked, wicked person who was maybe a terrible dictator or a murderer or a deceiver or a cheat or a fraud, why did he live until he was 95? Why did God allow that? Why did God not cut, cut him down when he was 45 or 50? Or that heretic who's caused so much trouble, teaching things which are absolutely unbiblical and wrong and misleading. And countless people follow him. And why did he have such a long ministry? when he was clearly not a believer, but an absolute enemy of God and a servant of Satan. Or is there a verse in the Bible that tells us God's purpose for allowing to live so long, wicked people, and so on? Well, here it is. It's verse 22. 
What? And actually, although it doesn't sound very nice, you get an even better sense if you put the word so in front of it. So what? The Apostle Paul. It doesn't sound nice, but that's the sense. So what? God is sovereign. This is his perfect will. This is what he's chosen to do. So what if God, because he desires to show his wrath, his, how righteous his indignation is, and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering, with immense patience, the vessels of wrath, the people who are going to condemnation, fitted, prepared to destruction. In other words, in their long lives, they are being increasingly fitted, prepared for righteous judgment. So that just as everybody could see what a hard, wicked person Pharaoh was, because God preserved him so that he could go on resisting him, and therefore God's righteousness in judgment was so obvious and clear, so it is here. God, with much patience, puts up with the evildoers so that the day of judgment will be shown to be righteous and perfect. Nobody will be able to say, but if, say, all evil people died early, but they might have repented. But there might have been a mellower side to them, a soft centre. And God didn't let them live. He did let them live so that it should be demonstrated that God is righteous in his judgment. And that's what's going on in the world today. You see the world, you see it, wicked organizations surviving, wicked people surviving, wicked policies being carried out for years. You say, oh, what is this or that government done now? Is it not amazing that God has not delivered some great judgment to that country or to this country on account of such and such? Well, this is the policy, the purpose of God, that he, his justice, when it does come, will be seen to be absolutely righteous. And people will have been proved to be as wicked as God says they are. And that is why. Mark you, judge, God's judgment often does come in life. For instance, when God throws down an empire which is godless and wicked and evil, it's usually survived for a very long time. Its uh, wrongdoing is plain to see. The persecution of Christian people in the old Soviet Union went on for a very long time and then God threw it down, but by the time it disintegrated, it was obvious to everyone and to posterity just how unbelieving and atheistic and anti-God it was. And so even in our country, who knows how God will leave in force evildoers who promote godless and anti-moral policies so that his judgment will be clear. But often... He will sow it down even before the day of judgment. And one after another, all wicked empires and enterprises have fallen. And God, in such a way that God has been vindicated. Who knows whether Christ will come or we will see great events taking place even before he comes that vindicate the word of God and God's righteousness and demonstrate the wickedness of human conduct, who knows? Who knows whether they'll... Somebody was suggesting this to me not very long ago, when they'll, whether there'll be an even worse version of AIDS will come and shake the whole uh, homosexual 
community and policy and aims before Christ comes again or whether it will wait until the end of time we don't know but God holds things open as he did with Pharaoh here it is in verse 22 so what what do you you cannot question God's perfect policy if God willing to show his wrath and to make his power known to vindicate his righteous indignation and his power in judgment endured with much long suffering and pain and patience on God's part the vessels of wrath fitted or prepared to destruction and then the second point here is in verse 23 and this is a separate point some translations modern translations insert the words in order that and they don't usually put it in italic to show they've inserted words they've tried to make the sentence make sense in an English way what if God endures the bad in order that he may show grace to his saved people that actually is not an argument but modern versions put in order however we won't go into that now verse 23 and yet another purpose of God that he this is why things go on as they are at the moment that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had afore prepared unto glory it's a purpose of God that his righteous indignation and power against sin will be demonstrated and it's a purpose of God that the riches of his glory in salvation will be seen. So God saves many people when they're young. We have many people here who were saved when they were young. Some as children, some as teenagers, some early 20s and we have people here who weren't saved until they were in their roaring 40s or their 50s or their 60s or their 70s who tasted so much of sin and had demonstrated so much rebellion against God and had spurned him and slandered him why does God do it this way why so that he can demonstrate the riches of his glory and his amazing kindness and his power in salvation. That's the second great thing he is doing, demonstrating the power of salvation in a wicked world. This is the policy of God and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had afore prepared by sovereign mercy and election unto glory and verse 24 which is strictly the third point even us whom he hath called not of the Jews only from the Jews only but also of or from the Gentiles and the third great policy of God shows the scope of his love the universal character of his love towards Jews who had been trained to believe in him and given wonderful advantages and yet spurned them or Gentiles who are seen as being uneducated spiritually and coarse and yet the great riches of God's glory has such scope that he saves from among Jews and Gentiles equally. We should go at far greater lengths through these verses because they're so extraordinary. But I want to come to conclusion with two practical matters. There are people who make too much of Israelites, of Jews, Christian people, saved people, Bible believers, but they've got it into their heads, as I'm sure you know, 
that the Jews are a very special people and the Gentiles are only second class citizens in the uh, kingdom of God and that the Jews will be revived again one day as a nation and some even think a temple re rebuilt and all kinds of things that are especially Jewish will be revived but that is not the teaching of scripture the teaching of scripture is that as it has always been, so it is especially in the Church of Jesus Christ that God saves Jews and Gentiles together now in the international Jewish-Gentile Church of Jesus Christ. That's the te teaching of Christ. You can see it in John chapter 10. You're familiar with the words, I'm sure. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, the Jewish fold. Them also I must bring, and they, that is, they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Those are the words of Christ. There is only now the church of Jesus Christ. Now, some people get so angry, if you teach along these lines, that... Uh, they have a way of um, turning people against one fold, one shepherd teaching. And they say, that is replacement theology. These misguided people, that is us and most traditional Christians, that make too much of the Jews' view didn't appear until the 19th century on any scale. They say they teach replacement theology and they make it sound awfully bad. They say that God isn't blessing the Jews anymore, that the church, the Gentiles, have replaced the Jews. Now, that's not true. That is not what we teach. What we teach is not replacement theology, that the Gentiles have replaced the Jews. What we teach, what Christ taught, what Paul taught, was something that we can call unification theology. That Jews and Gentiles have been joined together in the church of Jesus Christ. If you're doubtful about this, then when you go home, just read Ephesians chapter 2 from verse 13, right to the end of the chapter. There's a lot of verses there when Paul says over and over and over and over again, you are now one. There is just one church. Save Jews, save Gentiles. And that's how it will be all the way to the end. And he makes it so, so clear. But there's one other practical thing I wanted to mention before we closed. Somebody said to me once, some years ago, the trouble with you Calvinists, how seldom I mention that word in the pulpits. However, the trouble with you Calvinists, they say, is you cannot pray for the lost. And I've heard several people say that. And I've read that in several places in different articles. Calvinists cannot pray for lost souls. Where do people get that idea from? That Calvinists cannot pray for lost souls. Why at the very beginning of this chapter, chapter 10, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. There's Paul telling us how much he prays for the lost souls of Jewish people, his enemies, even though he knows that God is not going to save them all, he still prays for them and he calls upon God for them. And then in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and the early verses, we're commanded to pray for all people, yes, for their souls. Of course the Calvinist can pray. And the Calvinist can pray for souls and when you pray for a relation or a colleague or someone who is on your heart, this is what gives 
real power to your prayer. You believe in the sovereignty of God. I believe that God is sovereign in salvation. And if he determines and decides to work in a sovereign manner in a heart, that person will be saved. I believe that God has commanded me to pray and for lost people. He has commanded me, which means he must intend to answer prayers or to be prevailed upon by his people if he chooses to be prevailed upon. Number three, I believe that our prayers were heard in eternity past, if you can use that language, before the very foundation of the world. If I pray earnestly for a lost loved one or for anyone now, I believe my prayer may have been taken account of by God before he fixed the role of his elect before the foundation of the world. And if he determines to save, that person would be saved. If I were an Arminian, and I believed salvation is all down to man's own free will, I couldn't pray with that degree of confidence. I would have to say, I will pray to God to save my loved one, but the hands of God are tied because my loved one can resist him. And even prayer to God may be no good because God may choose to save him, but because I believe somehow that he's got absolute free will, he can resist God. So I can pray with even more confidence as a Calvinist than I could ever pray as an Arminian. Now, dear friends, my last comment, because you've been so patient. Listen to this, friends. We've been looking at God in his sovereign mercy, overruling in our lives, and determining to save us before we were even born. We deserve nothing. We owe everything to the mercy of God. How are we living? Have you got a hard heart and you don't pray much for other people and you don't sympathize and you don't call upon God and you don't put him first and you don't serve him most? When I owe everything to him, I can't say no. I was smarter than other people because I decided for Christ. I would never have done that if God had not, before the foundation of the world, decided to overrule in my rebellious, wicked heart. I owe everything to his mercy. Mercy alone brought me to the point where I repented and I ran to seek him. I owe him everything. Shouldn't I serve him with all my strength, put him first, Throng be one of those who crowds into the prayer meetings to pray for the souls of others. To the God who heard before the world even began. Well, these are some of the thoughts that we derive from this magnificent passage.